Welcome to episode number 34 of Colorado TechCast. Hey everybody, Trapper here. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Colorado TechCast. Colorado TechCast is a weekly podcast where I interview CEOs and leaders of Colorado-based technology companies. Join me each episode as I explore the Colorado technology community from the inside out. Bart Lorang is CEO and founder of Full Contact and Managing Director of V1 VC, funding partners and Startup Colorado. Born and raised in Bozeman, Montana, Bart is a proven entrepreneur, executive, and manager in the global technology industry. He's active in the startup technology community as an investor, mentor, writer, and speaker. With 2017 revenue of just more than $14 million, up 181% from 2015, Full Contact was recently added to the Denver Business Journal Fast 50, Metro Denver's fastest-growing private companies. Hey, Bart. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Tell me about Full Contact. What is it that you guys do? Yeah, Full Contact is a uh, cloud-based platform for managing um, uh, relationships uh, in and amongst people and with people and businesses. So we essentially can bring all your data about people, all your contacts in one place, keep them up to date, and then help you actually go and be awesome with people. We believe that life is all about people, about relationships, and uh, this is a, a universal truth. Uh, but the problem is that the data we, we manage and store about people uh, for our businesses and for our lives is not necessarily in great shape. Full Contact tries to solve that. So like you aggregate contact info from my email, LinkedIn, Twitter, things like that? You bet. Um, if you have iCloud and Gmail or Exchange, and a lot of people have multiple email accounts and social networks and data everywhere. And then every business has lots of systems, a lot of SaaS systems, a CRM, a, an email marketing system, a you know, marketing automation platform, a support system, a, you know, a data warehouse, uh, data all over the place, plus employees. So we try to bring all the businesses' contact data together as well and unify all of that uh, so that they can actually understand the people that they're doing business with better and then, you know, uh, try to be awesome with them to make uh, their relationships better with their customers. I think I first heard about you guys through one of Brad Feld's blogs. He was talking about full contact and you went through Techstars in 2011. Tell me a little bit about that. What was your experience with Techstars back then? Yeah. So uh, we went through in the summer of 2011 and at that time, our company name was called Rainmaker and we were um, we were essentially uh, had an API, and we had also a, an app that had gone viral on Lifehacker, and uh, you know we we went through the process, rebranded ourselves as Full Contact, uh, raised you know 350k of seed capital, something like that, um, and uh, really um, it was sort of a, a hypothesis, as all good companies are, uh, their hypotheses. And it, you know, it turned out to work that uh, people wanted to turn their partial contact fragments into full contacts, and that's the genesis of the name. Um, and uh, it has you know multiple uh, meanings in terms of fully connecting with people and uh, and things like that, uh, which we've been lucky with. Uh, but that's that's the simple concept: turning all the partial contacts into full contacts and create meaningful relationships out of those full contacts. So what got you interested in software entrepreneurship? I mean, have you always wanted to be a CEO of a tech company? So, you know, I started uh, you know, coding when I was eight years old or so, and I was writing software games and selling them on you know, five and a quarter inch floppies in, uh, in Montana. And uh, so, you know, uh, I was always just sort of very uh, naturally oriented towards computers. I don't think I had a, a particularly social bent as a child. Um, and uh, computers are something that you can gravitate towards because they are perfectly rational in their response to you, right? They're not irrational in terms of the they, they don't display emotions. They just if you're if you screwed up the code, it's going to tell you, and it's your fault, not somebody else's fault. So that that was always something that, that, that I enjoyed, and I really got ensconced in that as a as a kid, and uh, and then you know that's just sort of naturally progressed into. You know, I had a business when I was six, 15 or 16, you know, doing web design and repairing PCs and installing Windows 95 for people uh, with some high school buddies. And uh, um, this was back in the day when it was like Netscape 1.0, 2.0, uh, 
Internet Explorer 2.0, uh, you know, the, the days were ActiveX versus JavaScript. That was the, that was the battle. Uh, and, you know, dial-up modems going at, you know, 14.4 kbps was fast. Um, and so it was very, very early days, the Internet, building businesses. Um, and then uh, that company uh, got acquired um, you know, a couple of years in. Um, and then uh, ultimately the, the parent company I became a sort of full-time partner of, um, major owner of, uh, grew that company for 13 years. We were in system integration, consulting, web applications, a lot of different industries. Uh, we had a global presence and then, um, uh, you know, exited that business in 2009, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And uh, essentially, you know, was kicking around, decided to go to grad school, uh, met my wife, met my now wife in grad school, kind of got the bug to start another company, um, got a peek at her address book one night. Uh, I'm not sure why I was looking at her, her address book, but I was. And uh, I just was stunned by how amazing her Outlook contacts were. They were the most perfect, pristine contact records I'd ever seen. Uh, photo, first name, last name, spouse name, anniversary, you know, kids' names, birthday. Every data field you could imagine was perfectly complete. And I was just stunned because I had, you know, 5,000 contacts in my phone and my Outlook, and it was a mess. And every business I've ever been a part of or worked with, their, their, their contact data was a mess. And so I, you know, I quickly got the idea. I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great if a company just focused on this particular problem for every, you know, business and individual out there and fixes this uh, and cleans it up and makes the data amazing? And uh, then I started what would be full contact out of that. So, you know, my wife likes to take credit for it. I, I like to joke that, uh, you know, I'm so lazy to update 5,000 contacts manually that you know, not raised fifty five million in capital to try to solve that problem. So you know, laziness can be the mother of an engine, right? It turns out a lot of people have the same problem I did. Uh, my wife doesn't because she just updates them all manually, but uh, she only has about one hundred and eighty contacts in her phone. So entrepreneurs tend to be more connected and more plugged in and have far more contacts. So that's uh, that's how it kind of got here. Um, over time, uh, I've realized that contact information isn't the thing. It's the relationships that are the thing. You try to maintain these great contact details so you can keep in touch with people. You have great insights about people. You can remember critical details to make them feel important and improve your relationship. And relationships are actually the thing. Uh, and then I circle back to my childhood as, as a young boy in Montana of saying, wow, I had a relationship with a computer, but I didn't necessarily have great relationships with, with childhood friends. So I understood that, oh, wow, this whole business is really about me helping an earlier version of myself as a boy in connecting with people. Our corporate culture has emerged of, you know, be awesome with people is our one of our core values. Uh, our core purpose is to make relationships better. And so we're all in this, this process of really trying to connect with other human beings. And we happen to make uh, contact you know, management and identity resolution products. Um, but our core purpose is to, to help people connect. And so multiple contact information to a single person is a fairly niche problem you guys are trying to solve. And to have raised $55 million in, you know, in VC money, obviously there's a strong demand for this product out there. So who do you guys sell to and like, where do you play in the ecosystem? Are you sales focused? Are you CRM focused? Or just generally trying to get everybody on the same page? So we have lots of different verticalized revenue streams, but it, it's sort of foundational. It's a horizontal platform that cuts across. So any business that deals with people, which is all of them, you know, at those touch points along the customer journey, having a full 360 contact record is critical, right? And so we provide our capabilities as a platform to do that to enable those use cases in the ecosystem. Marketing tends to be the sort of early adopter of that stuff. If you're in a B2B environment, you sales gets involved, uh, customer service gets involved, uh, fraud gets involved, billing gets involved, analytics gets involved. It cuts across the organization. So if you think about uh, the need for customer 360s, it, it, it's pervasive. Uh, as well as nobody in the organization really owns the customer 360, but everybody's responsible for it. So, you know, it's really about 
providing a capability we can install into a business that unifies all this data, gets everybody on the same page, and then the applications can be built on top of that. Uh, and so what, the way I like to think about it is from the individual up to a business, it's we're really helping people who are trying to grow their, their companies. It might be their company they own, or they might work in marketing in the company, or they might be in sales and they own a book of business, right? But they're really trying to help their grow their business. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I've just recently started using full contact for my own use. And it's crazy the sources that it pulls from and how well it matches up people that there's a very thin connection between, right? So I've got somebody in my email and I've got somebody, you know, on Twitter, their profile pictures are different. Their contact information is different because one hasn't been updated since they've moved to Denver, but it still aggregates all of that from multiple sources and brings it together. And, uh, you know, now I've got their LinkedIn information, their Twitter information, their phone number, their address, their occupation, all in a single record, which is hugely beneficial, you know, when you're trying to keep track of everybody. Yep. And uh, we keep trying to improve that every day, bring new data sources to bear, we're just rolling out new integrations where you can sync with about 130 different SaaS applications. So a um, lot, of, lot of cool stuff uh, that we're, we're continuing to improve upon. So you guys are, what, 250 employees now? Yeah, yeah, about 250. So in seven years, scaled it from just yourself to that number of employees. What was your growth trajectory like? Was it fairly steady at first and then it took off, or were these through a lot of acquisitions? Or Tell me more about that. Yeah, we've, we've acquired like eight, eight smaller companies along the way. Um, it's been pretty steady trajectory, um, but if you zoom in far enough, every straight line, it looks jagged, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so the, you know, the, the acquisitions we've made have really been folks that are in our space that have solved super hard problems. We're primarily interested in accelerating our product portfolio um, uh, as well as adding great talent. So we haven't acquired a ton of, you know, customers or revenue with, uh, with any acquisitions from primarily like IP and, and talent based. Um, and so we've acquired, you know, businesses all over uh, New York, uh, Israel, Latvia, uh, India, uh, San Francisco, uh, you know, uh, Dallas. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we haven't been, uh, you know, concentrated only in the U.S. and so that we have an international dynamic as well to the business, which has made things um, challenging at, at times, but really rewarding uh, in the long run. Those offices in other countries, were those purely acquisitions or have you expanded your development center or your central hub to those countries? They were uh, acquisitions. Um, uh, that's how they, they came to be. And then depending on uh, the, we, we've struggled with different um, the U.S.'s uh, administration's uh, immigration policies have not been uh, very friendly, you know, frankly, for the last 20 years. Um, and so we've we've had plans to consolidate them and move folks to the U.S., but haven't always been able to make that happen. So we've said, you know what, all right, let's just grow our presence here instead. Um, and so that's been a, a sort of a uh, – and then now we've, we've done enough times that once you have a few international offices, the, you don't mind adding another one. Kind of cookie cutter after a while? No, nah, yeah, my finance group might not say cookie cutter, but uh, from my perspective, it's kind of your job. Let's go. <laughs> so you, you talked a lot about being you know, people-focused and, and caring about the relationships. How do you instill that culture that you have here in other countries that there may be more cultural barriers that exist there than exist here? Yeah. I think that what I've found is that regardless of the country or culture, it's they're just people. <laughs> and I have not found barriers um, that are there. Uh, once you cut through it all, it's, it, you develop a relation with somebody, they're a human being. And, um, you know, we have folks in Latvia and India and Israel, and there's different personalities and communication styles, but at the end of the day, they're still human beings. So what we, we, we do is we, we're a values-based organization, meaning we, hire, fire, reward, and recognize based upon our core values. And we take those very seriously. They're in employee assessments, um, and we think about it very carefully. The um, the other thing that we try to do is I do a practice with uh, every meeting I lead, which is a quick red, yellow, green check-in. And that's uh, the notion of, of actually asking the question, how are you doing today, really, right? Like, like, how am I like, really, um, you know, and red can be sort of a very triggered uh, survival 
emotional state. Green is present and calm and everything's good. And yellow is somewhere in between, but actually understanding what's going on uh, in the moment. And just by checking in uh, with the team, uh, you know, as a leader, you can understand where people are actually at. <laughs> and it's actually amazing what happens when people check in. They, they understand more about the human beings they're dealing with. And so somebody might be upset because their father-in-law or their mother-in-law is staying with them, uh, and it's a pretty stressful time uh, if they don't have a good relationship or maybe they got in a fight with their spouse. And they share this at the beginning of each meeting, not so it can become a group therapy session, but just so people can note what's go- actually going on with them and put it, put it aside and get to work. Um, and so that's, a, that's showing vulnerability, and vulnerability leads to empathy, and empathy leads to trust, and it leads to cohesive teamwork, regardless of, you know, where you're from or where you work or what country you're in. Um, and so we found that practice to be very helpful. So that also kind of reinforces the people-centered nature of the company as well, it sounds like. That's right. And, you know, another thing that we have is, um, is a policy called paid, paid vacation, which is the notion that um, you get paid $7,500 at full contact to go on vacation. But to get the money, you, one, have to go on vacation You, you to get the money. <laughs> Two is you can't work on vacation to get the money. And three is you have to fully disconnect and go off the grid to get the money. And so what I call it is I call it you have to disconnect to fully connect with the people that matter most in your life. Um, we have a lot of very hardworking people at Full Contact, and you actually have to tell them to go off the grid and not check their email or their text or get up, get off the digital devices and actually connect in person with the people you care about. And so that's actually helped reinforce the notion of people centricity. Um, if it's about the people and it's not about you know <laughs> your your smartphone, right? Um, so that's that's been helpful in reinforcing the cultural ethos. Didn't I see a picture of you riding a camel, looking at your smartphone? Yeah, that was uh, that was a, that was me in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, had started the business. It was six months in, and I think I was rebooting a server or checking email or something. I was on the on a lifelong like like a camel in Egypt in front of the pyramids with my now wife riding, and somebody snapped a photo of me looking at my phone, and I realized in that moment that I kind of had to make a change, and uh, this was not healthy. And, uh, so, you know, I've created policies at the company that help me obey the rules, <laughs> uh, like paid, paid vacation. It's a fairly iconic picture. I'm sure that a lot of listeners have seen it. It ran in, uh, like the business journal there for a while or one of the local magazines or newspapers. So, yeah, it's internationally famous. We've been on like 200 international news shows and, um, <laughs> it's on CNN, good morning, America, you know, uh, CBS or the Today show. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a very iconic picture of. My problem. <laughs> so to just encourage people to, to drop off the grid, you've got to have a lot of trust instilled in the organization that things won't get dropped, especially as the company grows quickly, you know, and as they do as many deals that you guys have. I'm sure the pace does not get any slower as you guys have grown. So having the trust that you can disconnect and things won't fall apart is huge, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you got to have, it's all about the people, right? And the relationships, you got to have trust in the folks. Uh, in your team. And, uh, you know, as you grow and scale, I like to tell entrepreneurs, it doesn't get any easier. It just gets harder. The mountain gets harder to climb, right? And so you, you need better people. You need uh, a more cohesive team. Uh, you need better capabilities to keep growing the business at the pace you're trying to grow it. Um, but I'm pretty fortunate to have a, a, a solid team that I, I trust in a ton. And they, uh, they give me the permission to, to go off grid and disconnect occasionally. So talk to me a little bit about stoicism and your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, as I'm, as I, uh, as you have progress uh, through life and the journey of, uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, you know, there's obviously very difficult times hour by hour, day by day. Um, you know, I like to uh, remind people that when you have a company of a few hundred, um, the average person has three personal crises per year or, Right. So, you know, you do the math and uh, you're dealing with that at an organizational level every day. There's there's just really crazy stuff going on. And um, I've uh, I've tried to learn a lot from past leaders, how they've dealt with uh, 
you know, the moments in time that have been challenging and difficult and put their leadership to the test. And recently, um, you know, started discovering uh, the works of the ancients, the Stoicism, the Seneca and, and Marcus Aurelius, just in terms of the, the examined life and the examined um, principles of leadership. Um, Stoicism to me is um, recognizing that, uh, like, things are hard and in the hard times are the maximum growth. Um, and often the, the, the unimagined fears are, are what's driving you, not actual reality. It's your own anxiety, your own emotional state that's, that's preventing you from uh, being the leader that you need to be. Um, and those are the things that I, I take away from. So I, I have a, uh, there's an email newsletter called the daily stoic, which is great. It just sort of shares a story every day. And I, I like to read that every morning. And then every, every night I'm reading, um, different, different letters, um, and the different books. Um, and I find it very grounding, right? <laughs> and I think in modern life, we, we kind of get caught up in the latest trendy thing, but you look at the wisdom of, of two, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, it's actually pretty astonishing how much um, hasn't changed. So what brought you to this moment? I mean, was there, a, was there a tipping point that got you to refocus on kind of living in the moment and knowing that growth comes through hard times? Um, no, I don't think it's a moment. I think it's a journey. I, I think, you know, having been an entrepreneur for 30 years, uh, it's a constant process. And there's, there's a book I like to give out to people called Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And I give this book out to different leaders in our organization. When I watch them going through their crucible moments where like they're, they're, they're going through an incredibly hard time, but they're ascending to the next level after that crucible is over with. And I think it's a process. Any CEO who's scaling is uh, going through hard moments constantly and recognizing it's a struggle, it's a process continuously, it's never going to go away, helps me grapple with it. So it's not like this, oh, magically, you went through the fires, and then on the other side, you're great. Now there's another fire, and then there's another fire, and there's another challenge ahead. And I, if, I, if I now examine the past 30 years of my life, and I remember the the challenges I was having as a young leader, as simple as having a direct performance feedback conversation with a single direct report. Like that was hard at a certain age, right? <laughs> and uh, now that doesn't even tip the radar, right, of like challenging for me. But at that moment, that was like the most anxious thing in my world. And through challenge and challenge, you, you overcome the, the fear of what's on the other side of that thing. And then the, the fear is imagined often more than real. And so I just think you got to be constantly improving, leaning into hard things, um, I'm a, I graduated from the University of Colorado Boulder and, uh, the mascot there is the Buffalo. And one of the things that is unique about buffaloes compared to cattle is that Buffalo run towards a storm to get through it faster while cattle run away from storms. And I think that's really amazing, uh, to think about in terms of how you behave when you see storms brewing, do you run towards it? Do you run towards problems or do you run away from problems? Right. And so I always implore our team to be a Buffalo and, and run towards storms. And I think it's just a good framing for how you live, live your life. Right. Yeah. I like that. I'd never heard of that before. The difference between Buffalo and cattle, but it's really insightful, especially as you're taking on challenges that you've never tackled before. Right. Yep. That's right. That's right. And it's, uh, it's really important to um, recognize that you're going to grow in that pain. You're going to grow. But just over the course of my career, I've worked with a lot of people who are reluctant to change and are reluctant to embrace the whole person versus, you know, just their territory alone. Have you encountered that, you know, within your companies? And if so, how do you overcome that? Sure. I mean, it's a cultural thing. There's people that might join that might not believe in that um, and they won't last long. Um, the, the, everybody uh, has to buy into the purpose, the mission of understanding about the whole person. It can be incredibly frustrating at times too, by the way, to manage people where you have to care about the whole person because it's a mandate in the corporate values. I mean, it's, it's much easier to try to pretend that they're just a work 
somebody that shows up at work and they do their job and they go home and you don't really worry about that. It's actually much more challenging as a leader and a manager to lean into the person's entire life. But ultimately, it's more rewarding. So there's certain folks who it's not the culture for them, and and that's fine. I mean, corporate cultures are a thing. They're, they're not they're not all made the same way. That doesn't mean it's good or bad from a cultural standpoint or from a, a teammate perspective that doesn't fit in. There's probably another company that, that's better for them if they don't like the uh, you know, the emotional aspect and understanding like it's about the whole person here. Um, and so you know, we have a we have a way of uh, of assessing that, and uh, you know, during the interview process, we try to make sure that they are very aware of that um, before they join. Have you seen other companies embrace a similar concept, or do you guys think you're kind of ahead of your time? Um, I think yeah, different companies embrace the concept uh, for sure. Um, uh, you know, in varying degrees. Uh, I think it's easier to do in a smaller startup-y. Uh, scaling environment than it is to at like a fortune 100 level, right? That's harder, but certainly like, it's just about the values that the, that the company ascribes to. So it's probably more about values than it is about size though. I like that. Yeah. Just kind of instilling it in and, and managing that culture as the company continues to grow. That's right. So what does the future look like for full contact? What are you guys working on? Where are you headed? I think where we're headed is we're trying to uh, basically like, make relationships better between people and people and people and businesses. And we have a clear, clear vision of where we want to head in terms of being the world's open platform for making relationships better. better. And I use the term open um, very intentionally. There's a lot of walled gardens out there, social networks and the like, but we're trying to be an open platform uh, to enable people to connect with other people and, and people connect with businesses. So, you know, we do believe that we will be public scale. Whether that means we need to go public or not is a different question. Uh, but the exit strategy, I don't have an exit strategy in the sense of the classical right after the sunset. My only way I think about exit strategies is simply how do I make sure that my investors have a good return. And there's lots of ways to do that in lots of different forms. There's public markets, there's private markets, there's strategic acquisitions. Uh, there's lots of different things we can do. To me, solve the customer problems, the rest take care, takes care of itself. From a product standpoint, I'm super excited about what we have rolling out here in the next year. I'm really I think, getting to the essence of, of helping people make relationships better and understand the full person at the same time. Um, so very, very excited. Uh, you know, my marketing team won't let me share here, <laughs> but the listeners can, uh, you know, stay tuned. Nice. Yeah, we'll definitely follow along as you guys grow. So you're VC backed. You said $55 million in VC funds raised. How do you pick a VC? Like, how do you pick somebody who you know you'll work with well? Because it's more than just money, right? Yes, that's a great question. I think a lot of entrepreneurs make this mistake um, of not being very thoughtful and just sort of taking the money. So you want to do business with people that share your values, just like in, in hiring, right? So you actually have to calibrate on the values with the VC as well. And uh, we do that. Uh, so every every single one of my investors and board members matches our core values, and they believe in our purpose. And that's the most important thing because you're getting into a 10-year relationship with, with folks. So it's really critical to uh, map that way. Um, I see a lot of uh, stories where there was values mismatch between the investor and the CEO, and uh, that usually doesn't end particularly well for one of those people. So, Bart, do you have any resources that you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a, an avid re reader, and uh, lately I've been reading um, uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. I found that uh, to be incredibly insightful, uh, as well as uh, simple works of the ancients, uh, the Stoicism um, authors, really, Seneca and uh, Marcus Aurelius and uh, Epicurus. Um, uh, those I found incredibly helpful. Uh, as far as podcasts, I find uh, Reed Hoffman's Masters of Scale to be uh, really good, good tactically, uh, as well as uh, my own, uh, my friend uh, Jerry Colonna and his company uh, Reboot. They have a great podcast about you know leadership and the, the struggles of leadership. Um, you know, I also am a really big fan of the book Traction by Gina Wickman, which is. He's the author of uh, Entrepreneur's Operating System, uh, and there's a lot of good pragmatic advice 
for running your business with a with a with a good framework of structure. Uh, so those are the things that are on my uh, bookshelf from a business standpoint. From a you know just spare time standpoint, I I really enjoyed recently the three body problem. Um, I can't really pronounce the author's name, but uh, it's a it, a Chinese book that's translated. It's about uh, um, the future of the human race over probably multiple millennia, and uh, it's 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 a it's a must read. I haven't heard of that, but I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Get links to all these in the show notes. Yeah, so principles is a hefty read. There's a video on YouTube that's maybe ten minutes that we'll link to as well. So if you guys, if people out there listening want to check out the video before reading the book, we'll get you a link for that as well. Bart, I really appreciate you coming on Colorado Tech House. Extremely well read and very thoughtful and insightful in terms of how you've nurtured your company. I don't think many people could have could have made so many acquisitions in different parts of the world and still maintained, you know, a cohesive culture focused on being awesome with people. I think that's something that a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs could take lessons from. So appreciate your coming on the show. Uh, if people want to find more information about Full Contact, how can they? Yeah, uh, check out our website, fullcontact.com. And uh, anybody can email me anytime, bart at fullcontact.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Colorado TechCast. Visit our website at coloradotechcast.com for episode show notes with links to all the great resources we've talked about in this episode. While you're there, click the subscribe button in iTunes so you'll never miss a new episode. I'm Trapper Little, and I'll talk to you again on the next episode of Colorado TechCast.